Bonsoir. Welcome to the newcomers and welcome back for the others. Chapter 23 of The Siege of Mackendall, Book 6 of Ranger's Prentice. Written by John Flanagan. Let's go. Mackhaddish looked up quickly, suspicion mixed with fear on his face as he heard the terms. He had expected something else from the wizard. A demon for riches, or power, or both. Information was the one thing he hadn't expected Mackhaddish to ask for. It's a simple question, Mackhaddish continued. Tell me. What you have planned. In spite of the terror that gripped in his insides, the discipline MacHaddish had learned over long years as a warrior and leader reasserted itself. To disclose plans like this was treachery, nothing less. His jaw set in a hard line. And he began to shake his head. Malcolm's staff began its inexorable work again, whipping at the circle that protected the Scottish. McCaddish knew his own folklore. He knew the Black Circle was his only protection against Sir Thricknish. He knew that once there was a gap in the circle wide enough for the demon's hands to enter. It will be the end of him. Sir Threknish would drag him, screaming from the circle and into the black night under the trees, and into a greater blackness beyond. He watched the gap widen. A lifetime of loyalty and discipline struggled with a lifetime of superstition. And superstition won. He reached out and grabbed hold of the tip of the staff, stopping its deliberate movement. Tell me what you want to know, he said in a low voice, his shoulders slumped in defeat. Your plans for attack, Mokum said. How many men are coming? When are they going to be here? There was no further hesitation from the Scottish. He had committed to betray his trust, and he could see no point in hedging. Two hundred men, initially, from the clans MacFrewin, MacKentick, and MacHaddish. The commander will be Caleb MacFrewen, warlord of the senior clan. And the plan is to occupy Castle Mackendall, then spread out further into Norgate V, correct? MacHaddish nodded. Mackendall will be our anchor point, our stranglehold. Once we have neutralized that and occupied it, we can bring more and more men through the passage. A few meters away, Will and Harris exchanged worried glances. Both knew the potential danger of having an armed force of 200 men loose in the province. And those 200 will be just an advance party. Once a foothold was gained, more would follow in their tracks. It will take a major army to dislodge them, and that army will have to come from the south. It will be months before King Duncan could put a large enough force together and then march them north. By then, the Scottish will be firmly entrenched, and it might well prove impossible to drive them back through the passage to the high plains of Picte. Particularly if they held the Castle Mackendall in strength. If this went unchecked, it could mark the beginning of a long, drawn out war, with no guarantee of victory for their Arallowan forces. 
called on Moss to redraw the maps of Raluen and Picta and move the permanent border 50 kilometers to the south. But most of this they had already guessed. There was one question still remaining that needed answering, and that answer might well hold the key to Nordgate's future. When? Malcolm posed the question. This time McHaddish did hesitate. He knew, as well as they did, that this was the vital question, and for a moment his loyalty reasserted itself. But not for long. Malcolm twisted the point of the staff from his grip and moved it toward the thin black line of powder once more. Three wicks, Mikadish said, a nod of surrender in his voice. Three weeks from yesterday. Caleb MacFrewen is already gathering the clans. They're marching to the border now. It will take time for them to go through. The few passages that are open and then resemble into marching order. They'll be at Mackendall in three weeks. Malcolm stepped back a pace studying the crouching figure before him. He saw the slumped shoulders, the donkeist eyes, and the look of defeat. McHaddish was a broken man, a man who had betrayed his honor, and Malcolm had no intention of crowing over the fact. Nor did he plan to reveal to McHaddish that he had been tricked. But that was less because of any sympathy for the man, and more because he realized that there might come a time when he needed more information. Thank you, he said simply. He took a sack from an inner pocket and bent forward, pouring black powder into the ground to restore the gap he had forced in the circle. Then. He walked quickly to the smoldering remains of the fire and threw another handful of powders into the coals. There was deep whiff and a vivid yellow flash, and the flames reignited instantly, climbing high into the dark sky above Grimsdale Wood. He looked at the three Scandians who had watched the proceeding in terrified silence. We're safe, he said. Sir Thrick Nish can't harm us now. The tension went out of the Scandian's body as he spoke. They gripped their weapon a little less fiercely, although Will noticed that they did not actually let go of them. Then, from behind Markham, they heard an unexpected sound. McHaddish was sobbing, but whether from shame or relief, no one could tell. They spent the rest of the night in the clearing, throughout the hour of darkness. Malcolm replenished the flames whenever it seemed necessary with the strange chemical he carried. He was determined to maintain the illusion that he had created for McHaddish's benefit. As the first grey light of day crept over the treetops, they climbed stiffly to their feet and headed back to Hiller's clearing. They travelled silently, even by daylight. Crimsdale was a foreboding place that discouraged idle conversation, and the even event of the night before were fresh in all their minds. There was general lightning in their collective mood when they finally stepped into the open space that marked Hiller's clearing. The other scans called greetings to the three who had combined the small party. Why the scouty soldiers looked curiously at their general, who kept his eyes averted from them as he sank to his knees, allowing Trobor to transfer his chain once more to the larger look. 
The stiffness and pride were gone from McCaddish's body language. He was a char shattered man. Malcolm, who had whipped off his wizard's makeup and resumed his normal grey robe before they left the clearing, began to will and harass as he returned towards his little cottage. We'd better talk, he said. Orman will be anxious to hear the news. The two young men agreed and followed him to the cottage. As they entered the warm polar, the healer slumped gratefully into one of his carved wooden armchairs. Oh, that's better, he said, the relief obvious in his voice. I'm getting too old for all this playing around in the forest. You've no idea how exhausting it is. It can be prancing around in high boots, pretending to be an evil wizard. He twisted and quarreled in his seat, grimacing as he favored one side of his back. Then Nigel let that flying face get too low and nearly took my head off with it, so I had to duck out of the way think I might have ricked my back, he said sorely. As the sound of the, their voices, Orman and Xander had appeared from an inner room. Orman looked from one to the other. I take it the expedition was a success, he asked. Malcolm shrugged, then obviously wished he hadn't, as his back twinged in pain. You could say that, Harris answered for him. Malcolm got the names, the numbers, and the timetable. Took him less than twenty minutes to, he added, admiringly. On top of that, he scared the delights out of Magadish and our skinned friends. Malcolm smiled at him. That's all? Harris grinned sheepishly. As a matter of fact, you made me a little nervous, too, he admitted. And me, Willa did. And I know how most of the illusions are done. Well, you're one upon me, Horace told him. Everything came as a wonderful surprise, as far as I was concerned. The demon's face in the fog and the giant warrior... They were your normal projection illusions, weren't they? Will asked Malcolm. Ora snorted. Normal, he muttered under his breath. Malcolm ignored him and replied to Will's questions. He was justifiably proud of the technology he had created to form the illusions, and he couldn't help preening just a little. That's right. The fog serves a double purpose. It gives me a kind of screen to project on, but it also dissipates and distorts the projection, though they never seen too clearly. If McCaddish had got a clear look at them, he might have seen how crude they are. The suggestion is all important. The viewer tends to fill in the empty spaces for himself. Usually, he does for a more terrifying job than I could. The lights in the tree I've seen before, too, Will continued. After all, we use them when we're signaling Alice. But the flying face, the one that nearly hit you, how did you manage that? Ah, yes, I was quite pleased with that one. Although it nearly brought us in dawn... Nigwell and I spent most of the afternoon rigging that. He's only seventeen, but he's quite an artist. It was nothing more than a paper lantern with a face inscribed on it in heavy black lines. We mounted it on a fine wire that ran across the clearing. It was invisible in the dark. The idea was it was supposed to swoop down then disappear into the tree opposite. 
But it just seemed to fly apart into sparks. Well said. Malcolm nodded enthusiastically. Yes, that's another little chemical trick I learned some years back. A combination of sulfur and saltpaper and... He hesitated. Proud or not, he wasn't willing to share all the details with them. And a bit of this and that, he continued. It creates a compens that burn fiercely or explodes if you can't win it. It was very effective, Horace said, remembering how the red shape had swooped out of the sky, flashed across the clearing, then dissolved into a shower of flame and sparks into the treetop. I think it was the final straw from McCaddish. It nearly gave the game away, Malcolm replied. As I said, it fell lower than it we expected and nearly hit me. That would have tangled me up in the wires and might well have set my clock on fire. If McCaddish had seen that happen, he would have seen through the whole thing. It's often the way, well said. Failure is just a few seconds away from success. That's true, Malcolm agreed. Orman had listened patiently as they dissected the event of the previous night. Now he thought it was time for a few details. So, what's the situation? he asked. Not good, Horace said. There's a war party of two hundred Scotty. Clansmen's assembled on the other side of the border, and they'll be here in less than three weeks. So we have to take McKendall before they get here. Well put in. Armin, Xander, and Malcolm all nodded. That much was obvious. It was Horace who had a jeering knot in the conversation. And we're going to have to find an extra hundred men to do it, he said. And that's the end of chapter 23. As I'm pretty sure you heard, I'm still struggling quite a lot with uh, the TH sounds. Uh, sometimes I just use S sound for TH or TH sounds for S sounds because in French there is no TH so it's quite a hassle uh, that in Z H also like <laughs> or something like that quite hard well any anyway see you at next chapter I guess bye